Okay, yes, right. we've had a problem here. This is a phrase that you have most likely heard at some point in your life. The phrase, Houston, we have a problem, was said by astronaut Jack Swigert three days after the launch of the Apollo 13 mission in April 1970. This mission aimed to return man to the moon after two successful missions, Apollo 11 and Apollo 12. But what no one expected was that Apollo 13 would completely change the future of space travel and that even today we deal with the consequences of everything that happened during that mission. And it is important for us to remember the historical context that led to the existence of the Apollo program. Because as you will see, everything is connected and things could have been different. In the 1960s, the world was in the midst of the space race driven by the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. And from this space race, various achievements occurred, such as putting the first man in space in Earth's orbit. But the United States decided on a slightly more ambitious goal, to put a man on the moon. And thus the Apollo program was born which would be a series of numbered missions with the aim of placing humanity on the moon, a goal that was achieved in 1969 with the Apollo 11 mission. Hey, Pedro here. This video you are watching was originally in Portuguese, my native language. This is the attempt of our team to translate it to English, and I sincerely hope you enjoy it. Your feedback is extremely important to us. Now, back to the video. In the same year, the Apollo 12 mission repeated the feat of placing astronauts on the moon who aimed to conduct experiments, collect samples, and continue part of the work that the previous astronauts had started. And human beings being human beings, with the success of both, people began to lose interest in the program, as the great goal that sparked their curiosity had already been achieved, landing on the moon. And this became a problem for NASA and seriously threatened the program, because the necessary investment depended on the government and the government considered public opinion. With less interest, there was less investment, and this cast doubt on whether the next missions would be possible. Some were even cancelled, such as Apollo 19 and 20, with parts of Mission 18 being reused for a collaboration with the Soviet Union called Apollo Soyuz. And with all this at stake, the entire future of space missions and the program were directly tied to Apollo 13. And indeed, everything changed completely, but because of something that even NASA was not prepared to deal with. The mission was born with the purpose of returning to the moon to continue the objectives of previous missions, as well as to install equipment such as seismometers and solar panels. And in this way, it would be possible to better study the lunar environment, understand the seismic activity of the moon, and continue building the necessary tools for the man's stay on the moon in a future considered near at the time. The area that would be explored is called Fra Mauro, a region of geological interest that would help to better understand the processes that formed the moon and its craters. This would be the first time that the main interest was to study the lunar surface and regions, as both Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 focused more on the technological aspect of the vehicles we had. The rocket used was the Saturn V, which would be the same as the other missions. The rocket had three stages, called S1C, S2, and S4B. Each stage represented a set of parts and engines that would burn the fuel to the end and separate from the rocket, initiating the next stage. As fuel, Liquid oxygen was one of the oxidizers, so you can already get an idea that oxygen was an important component in various stages, from the launch to the maintenance of the astronaut's life support system. All missions of the program used spacecraft with three parts, a command module called CM, which referred to where the crew stayed and controlled the spacecraft. The service module, or SM, for the spacecraft's support and propulsion systems and finally, the lunar module, LM, which would take two astronauts to the lunar surface. The project was designed in such a way that upon reaching the moon, one crew member would remain controlling the command and service module, while only two would go to the surface of the moon. And on this mission, the astronauts designated to go to the moon were Commander Jim Lovell and pilot Fred Hayes of the lunar module called Aquarius. The initial idea was for pilot Ken Mattingly to be responsible for the command module, which was named Odyssey. And in this way, the mission would follow protocols and a schedule very similar to those of the preceding missions, which was successful. Follow the trajectory to lunar orbit, land the lunar module while the command and service module would remain in orbit, and then return to Earth with gravitational assists from the moon itself. The success of this entire schedule was necessary for NASA precisely because of the political and economic context the agency was in at the time, 
However, the launch of Apollo 13 dealt with public disinterest, with viewership numbers not even reaching 10% of those for Apollo 11. But what NASA did not know yet was that these numbers would increase, and they were about to experience a unique moment in history that even they did not expect. The launch took place on April 11, 1970, and things had already started to go wrong before and during the launch. The first problem arose when Charles Duke, who was the backup pilot for the lunar module in case Fred Hayes couldn't go, contracted rubella seven days earlier. Since the crew members, both the primary and the backups trained together in simulations, they were all exposed to the disease. Of all of them, only Ken Mattingly had not been immunized against rubella and had to be removed from the mission just four days before the launch when the backup Jack Swigert took his place. According to the protocol, the entire official crew would have to be replaced by the backup crew. But since Charles Duke was sick, the protocol had to be altered, keeping two official crew members. And an interesting fact, Fortunately, Mattingly did not end up contracting the disease and participated in Apollo 16 along with Charles Duke. Thus, the astronauts aboard the Saturn V were Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert. But the problems didn't stop there, and as you will see, they had actually started years earlier, becoming a cascading effect. About five minutes after the launch, another error occurred when one of the engines of the second stage, the S2, stopped working two minutes before the start of stage three. This caused the remaining engines to burn longer than initially expected, and the final stage had to burn about 9 seconds more to achieve the necessary thrust. But despite the initial scare, the launch was successful, and for about 3 days everything seemed normal in the mission, with the astronauts interacting with the control center on Earth, located in Houston. They recorded videos for the public, played around, and showed their daily life with tutorials on how to drink water inside the spacecraft, almost like a vlog in space. The atmosphere seemed relaxed for both the astronauts and the control center, with everything proceeding as expected even after the scare with the failure of one of the engines. But soon all of this would change, and it would change not only the course of the mission, but also the lives of the astronauts and the direction of all space exploration. After the astronauts had completed their routine activities, the control center asked Jack Swigert to turn on the fans located in the oxygen tanks. This was because the pressure reading seemed to be having issues, and the fans helped mix the oxygen to provide a more accurate reading. This procedure was done once a day, but due to the request from the control center, Swigert did as asked, and 90 seconds later, there was an explosion. 26 seconds later, the famous phrase, OK Houston, we've had a problem here, was said by Jack Swigert, and about a minute later, it was repeated by Commander Jim Lovell. According to astronaut Fred Hayes, who gave an interview to NASA in 2020, they did not know what had happened, and that was when Jim Lovell decided to investigate. In fact, Lovell mentioned in later interviews that he initially thought it was just Hayes banging on something, which was a prank he used to play to scare the other two. But seeing that Hayes seemed unaware of what was happening, he decided to investigate and left the lunar module, where he was, to the service module. In the service module, he saw that the panels showed the oxygen measurement was zero in one of the tanks and decreasing in the other tank. The explosion of one of the tanks hit the other, and both ended up being damaged, causing the oxygen to escape. And this made Lovell look out the window and realize that the oxygen was escaping from the spacecraft at a high speed. Within minutes, the mission turned into a survival mission, and landing on the moon was out of the question. It would be necessary to use all the fuel cells for this, and since the cells needed oxygen to function, they only had a few hours of duration left. Fred Hayes said that, at that moment, the feeling he had was one of disappointment because he knew that landing on the moon would be impossible. With the oxygen issue becoming critical, the spacecraft had several of its functions turned off to save battery and maintain only the necessary functions. For example, the oxygen needed to keep the astronauts alive. The control center on Earth, which was being led by director Gene Kranz, instructed the astronauts to use the lunar module as a sort of lifeboat. This was something used in the training of the Apollo 10 crew, but it had never been put into practice, as the chance of it happening was minimal. One of the problems was that the lunar module was designed to accommodate only two people at a time, and in this case, it would have to accommodate three people for an indefinite period. Another problem was that the lunar module did not have the same controls as the command module, because of this, Jim Lovell had to copy the commands by hand before returning to the lunar module with Fred Hayes and Jack Swigert. The initial idea was to return to Earth without getting closer to the moon, 
but Kranz and his team on Earth concluded that this would be impossible due to the amount of fuel required. Kranz and a team of physicists and astronomers made calculations that concluded the best approach was to use the Moon's gravitational field as a pushback to Earth. And these gravitational assists were already used before. And even today we take advantage of the gravitational fields of the Moon and other planets to send probes even farther. Jim Lovell also did the necessary calculations to determine the trajectory, which was initially calculated for a lunar landing but now had to bypass the natural satellite. And this became even more difficult because it was impossible to see the sky and navigate by the stars, the moon, or even the Earth due to the debris from the explosion. The changes were a joint effort between the astronauts, who were in the module, and the technicians at the control center on Earth. After completing the trajectory, the spacecraft would return to Earth in four days. But a burn at a point around the moon could reduce that time and make the spacecraft land in the Pacific. The burn occurred at a point almost 400,800 kilometers away from Earth and entered the Guinness Book as the farthest distance a human has been in space. The Pacific Ocean was the priority. NASA had more bases to recover the astronauts when they landed than in the Indian Ocean, which was expected without the burn. And on the return to Earth, all non-essential systems were turned off, causing the cabin temperature to drop to values lower than 4 degrees Celsius. And this made it difficult even to sleep or rest. According to Fred Hayes and Jim Lovell, everything inside the module was damp and everything was dripping as the water had condensed, making the cold even more extreme. Despite everything being damp and dripping, the drinking water had to be rationed among the three astronauts inside the module, causing each of them to drink about one cup per day. The dehydration was severe, causing the three to lose almost 15 kilograms in a few days. Fred Hayes developed a urinary infection due to the extreme environment and dehydration. Since only two astronauts were going to the lunar surface in the original mission, they only had two spacesuits. In other words, it was not possible to heat everyone at the same time. They decided not to use the suit because, according to Jim Lovell, it could get too hot. So Swigert used whatever he could to cover himself. Another problem was the amount of CO2 inside the module, which was controlled with lithium hydroxide canisters to absorb it. However, the amount was adjusted for two people, not three. Therefore, in a short time, the amount of carbon dioxide continued to increase. And it was thanks to the effort from Earth, together with the astronauts, that they managed to come up with a solution using duct tape. Always remember this when people say that duct tape can fix everything, even if your life is at risk in space. To return to Earth, another problem arose that had to do with the thrust for re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Usually part of the service module's infrastructure was used for this purpose, but it had already been jettisoned earlier. New techniques had to be quickly studied using a combination of the lunar module and command module. And in addition, a part of the lunar module had a barrel of plutonium that would be used as fuel for experiments on the moon. So it was necessary to land in a place where the radioactivity would not cause major damage. Fortunately, the astronauts managed to land near Samoa six days after the mission began, which was considered a successful failure. The original mission was not accomplished, but the unique situation created by the accident made the return of the astronauts to Earth one of the most successful missions in the history of space exploration. Furthermore, the return of Apollo 13 to Earth was the second most watched space event, only behind Apollo 11 landing on the moon. This reignited public and media interest worldwide to see how the landing would go and concern for the astronauts. But no one could have imagined that the accident would forever change space exploration. The first consequence was that the oxygen tanks were updated and their configuration was altered. The intention was to not leave them close to each other, so that if one exploded, at least the others would remain safe. Although Apollo 14 managed to accomplish Apollo 13's original mission, things were never the same again. In the long run, public opinion became negative about space missions, as Apollo 13 once again exposed the dangers of putting lives in space, and this further affected government funding for the missions. It didn't take long for the last Apollo missions to be cancelled, and returning to the moon seemed like an unnecessary risk to many people. The investment, technology and risk added up so that gradually the missions were stopping and the return to the moon was left for a distant future. I say distant because it is only now, in the 2020s of the 21st century, that there are new plans to return to the moon with the Artemis missions, which for those who don't know, is Apollo's twin sister in Greek mythology. After the mission, investigations were carried out to understand what caused the accident. The investigation discovered that the problem occurred in the oxygen tank too, where the insulating part of the electrical circuits of the fans was damaged. And because they were damaged, 
When Swigert turned on the fans at Houston's request, it caused a short circuit, igniting the spark with other gases present there, such as hydrogen. And with the temperature of the gas increasing, the pressure in the tank soon rose, creating a true explosion that damaged the spacecraft. They discovered that oxygen tank 2 was present in Apollo 10, but it was removed for maintenance before Apollo 10 was launched. And during this exchange, the tank was dropped on the ground, but it did not appear to have any damage. The problem was the internal damage, which in some tests even showed that the tank did not empty properly. But they believed that just increasing the pressure would solve it. And this increase in pressure raised the heat inside, which damaged the wires, leaving them practically exposed and ready to explode. And as if that wasn't enough, during Apollo 13 they made a voltage switch in some of the spacecraft's systems, including systems connected to the thermostat. But they forgot to inform the company that manufactured the thermostats about this change, so they were not working properly, making it difficult to monitor the temperature in the tanks. A series of errors led to the accident that could have ended in one of the worst tragedies in space exploration. The Apollo 13 mission shows how anything can be a risk, like even dropping an oxygen tank on the ground. Imagine how many more things are just as sensitive on a trip to the moon. What is reassuring is knowing that technology has advanced, and we are about to witness new missions to the moon in the coming years with the Artemis project. And this act may have been something good for us to further improve and reduce even more the possible risks in such journeys. Fortunately, Artemis I has already started off on the right foot and has been quite successful, and the future really does seem promising. But it is always good to remember that it was the efforts of astronauts like those of the Apollo 13 mission that enabled us to reach the moon and also understand a little more about it, which is humanity's first stop in the universe after Earth, of course. The story of Apollo 13 is terrifying, intriguing, and fascinating. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much and see you next time.